So uh, thanks, Sebastian. Thanks, Cookpad, for organizing this track. Uh, my name is uh, Sebastian said, It's Chris Salzberg. Uh, the title of this talk is the elusive attribute. Uh, thanks for coming to this talk. I was really worried that being the last, sort of the last set of talks of the, of the whole conference, that everybody would be dead and nobody would come to this talk. But I'm really glad to see so many people here. Um, so this is a, a track on unpacking Rails. And one of the other speakers uh, mentioned that you know Rails is really, really big. Uh, and there's a lot to unpack in Rails. Um, and there's a lot of parts in there. Uh, and there are some of those parts that we know, and there are other parts there that, that we don't know, but we kind of know that we don't know them. But actually, I think there's a lot more, right? And so this is a quote uh, by a guy you may know uh, named Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, he, this is a kind of a famous quote, actually. Uh, probably many of you have heard this. He made this uh, statement in 2003 in a press conference in response to a journalist. Uh, he said, as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. The, we also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. So I know bicycles. Um, I've been basically on bicycles uh, as far back as I can remember before I could even walk, really. This is a picture of uh, me when I was something like, I think, four years old or so, uh, with my dad on a bicycle. My dad is Dutch, uh, and the Dutch are very fond of their bicycles, you may know. And my dad is no exception. So he raised my, my brother and I uh, to have a real kind of respect for the importance of bicycles. And I grew up in Montreal, in Canada. I'm Canadian. Uh, and you may, uh, you may know that Montreal, well, you may not know, uh, Montreal is a real cyclist city, which is kind of surprising given how, how freaking cold it is there <laughs> half the year. Um, people really bike through all kinds of weather you really couldn't imagine. And, and I was no exception, so I always biked when I was there. And then in my 20s, I moved to Amsterdam in Holland for a couple of years, and uh, Amsterdam is sort of the world capital biking cyclist. So that's, I was biking the whole time I was there. Uh, and then, as Sebastian mentioned, uh, I moved to Tokyo. That's where I've lived for many years now. Uh, and I still bike in Tokyo. Uh, that is not me. Uh, but I have, I have biked through this intersection. And so bicycles are still a really, really important part of my life. Uh, I use them every day. I really couldn't live uh, without my bike. So I know, I know that I know bicycles as a user. I also know uh, that there are things that I don't know uh, about bicycles. So if my bike uh, breaks or something and it's any, anything beyond sort of getting the chain back on, uh, I'm kind of clueless and I, I don't really know. So I just bring it to the shop and they fix it for me. Um, but recently, uh, I discovered something that I didn't know, uh, that I didn't know about bicycles, which is that I didn't know how to draw a bicycle. <laughs> uh, and if you've never tried this before in your head right now, try to do this. Try to put the frame, the pedals, and the chain uh, on this bicycle. Um, and you may find that it's a surprisingly difficult thing to do. Um, in fact, it's such an interesting uh, thing that cognitive psychologists have studied it as a demonstration of how our mind can trick us into thinking we know things that we don't actually know. So these are four uh, drawings of bicycles from a, a, a study where participants were asked to, as I just said, draw the pedals, chain, and frame onto these bicycles. Uh, and as you can see, uh, none of these bicycles would ever actually work. Uh, there's all kinds of... <laughs> There's all kinds of interesting uh, innovations on these bicycles. <laughs> uh, but but one, one way you can sort of see, well, OK, so here, oh, sorry. Here's another picture of a bicycle. So this bicycle may not be so obvious um, if there is anything wrong with it. Um, and, and so uh, one way you can kind of see whether you know, a drawing of a bicycle like this would actually work um, is to go out and actually sort of uh, implement it. Um, and this bicycle, in fact, has been sort of implemented. Uh, and this is actually what it might look like if you were actually to build this bicycle. Um, and this is kind of interesting now. This is actually um, a, a one, one example, one, one rendering from an um, art, art project, actually, by an artist named uh, Gianluca Gimini, an Italian artist. And he found this phenomenon of drawing bicycles so fascinating that he went out and he started asking everybody he knew to draw on bicycles. And of course, most of the bicycles, uh, like the ones I just showed you, were in some way, uh, you know, they had problems with them. But he found this so fascinating. They were all different. He went out and rendered them all like this. Um, and it's a really fascinating thing. It's called Velo Velocipedia, so you should look it up. There's some really interesting pictures. This one's interesting because it's not, it's not that obvious. You have to look at it a bit carefully to see what, what would actually be wrong with it. But, but this, this bicycle would not work. Uh, if, you, if you sat on it, it would pretty much collapse. And so in this, in this process of getting all these people to draw on bicycles, uh, Jimini found something really interesting. This is from an interview. Um, 
where he, he talks about this and he found that people, even like myself who ride a bicycle every day, they, they generally don't know actually how to draw a bicycle completely accurately. Uh, but there, there is one group who is statistically, he found, was statistically much better uh, at drawing bicycles. And these are people who actually sort of fix bicycles with their hands. They actually know how the parts work together and they, they know more than just the form, they know the function of that form. So this is a uh, quote from that, from an interview, where he says, people who are really into bikes start out from the frame. They represent that small percentage of people who get the drawing perfectly right. Most other people tend to start from what they are most sure of. So for nearly everyone, it's the wheels. I saw many people drawing all the rest in the hope that positioning the handlebar, saddle, and pedals would help them figure out the frame. Okay, so what does this have to do with attributes, right? So I think um, attributes, a little like bicycles for myself anyway, and people who ride them and people who know them, are, are something that's really familiar to us, right? If you're using rails, you're using attributes, and you're using them everywhere, right? You're using them in your views, you're rendering them in your views, you're, you're filtering the controllers, you're sending them through your channels. I mean, they're everywhere. And they seem kind of simple on the surface, right? Um, but what I'm going to try to argue to you today and explain to you today is that attributes are actually elusive. And they fall in that category of things, like I mentioned, that you think you know, but you actually don't know that you don't know. And one way to bring out these things that you think you know, but you don't actually know that you don't know, uh, is like those drawings of bicycles, is to actually draw how this thing would actually work. And I think if I asked you all to draw how an attribute works, of course the drawings would all be different, like the drawings from that art project I mentioned, but I think there'd be some common elements. Uh, and one of those elements I suspect would be that you would draw this. You draw a method, right? This would be like the title on your, on your post model or something. And this is like the wheel on your bicycle, right? That's the thing that you know must be there. And then, then you'd probably, we're talking about active record here, you'd probably draw a column, that's where the thing, this thing gets its information from, its data from, in your table, in your, in your database. Uh, and then you'd probably go and try to draw some kind of mapping from the method to the column. Um, and this is like the frame of the bicycle, right? And I bet many of you would draw this last. And so what I want to do today is we're going we're gonna to do this in three parts. So in the first part, I'm going to take this picture here, and like that picture of the bicycle, we're going to kind of implement it. And then we're going to sit on it, and we're going to watch it crash. <laughs> um, in the second part, then, we're going to redraw it starting from the frame. And we're going to see how that looks. That's going to be sort of a more accurate representation of how it actually is implemented in practice. And then in the third part, we're going to see what's actually wrong with that frame and how we can possibly improve that. OK, so before to that, um, it's about to introduce me. This is my kind of late introduction here. These are kind of my attributes. As I said, my name is Chris Salzberg. My handle is Shioyama, which uh, is a translation, translates to uh, Salt Mountain, which is approximately my last name. Uh, I work for a company called Dejika here, and they uh, graciously funded me to be here. So uh, if anybody's interested in working at a great company in Tokyo, uh, let me know. Uh, I write about stuff like the module builder pattern, if you've heard that expression, at my blog, Digima.com. And also, I have an, a gem called Mobility for Translating Model Data. OK, enough about me. Um, let's talk about methods and columns. So to start this, <clears throat> I want to start from a pull request, which I made to Rails actually um, about a month and a half ago. And the pull request is called Give Generated Attribute Methods Module a Name. Uh, it's a very small pull, requ pull request. It's only a five-line change, and it's a one-line addition. Uh, it was merged. So if you go on Rails Master, it's there now. Uh, and it doesn't really do a whole lot, actually. So to see what it does, you can go and you can just take any active record class. I'm taking the, like a post here. And you just look at the ancestors. Uh, and this is before the change. So if you look at the ancestors here, you're going to see a bunch of mixed-in modules and classes that we inherit from and this kind of thing. And what I want to highlight here are these two things here. Uh, these are actually, um, they look different from the rest because they don't have a constant attached to them. They're, they are anonymous modules. They're actually instances of a subclass of the module class called Active Record Attribute Methods Generated Attribute Methods. And this is actually a module builder. I'm not going to talk in detail about that, but I've talked about it before and written about it before. You can look it up. Basically, you just need to know this is an anonymous module. And so if you jump to uh, Master Branch right now, or, or Rails 6 when it comes out, this is what it will look like. And this is what that change, that pull request did. It gave these things a name. So now it's like post-generated attribute methods. And that won't really change anything in your application. But it's sort of important because these modules are, in one way, are very important. So to see how they're important, we can just go and create a post here. So create a post, give it the title, uh, the elusive attribute. And then we can go, and one of the other speakers talked about introspection. So we're going to use introspection here. We can say, post, give me the method object for this method title. This is Ruby now. This is not Rails. Uh, we just say, OK, we want this thing. It'll return to you this method object. Everything in Ruby is an object. So you get this, this method object for the method title. And then we can say, OK, method, 
Um, where are you defined? So this is actually a useful trick uh, when debugging, by the way. Uh, and you can ask this, and if you're in master right now, it will return to you exactly that module, the post-generated attribute methods module. And then we can say, okay, what's this module doing? Let's see what other instance methods it has. And if you call instance methods on this thing, you're gonna see a whole slew of different methods, right? You're gonna see the methods, all the methods that have to do with the, this title column. Uh, so like type, like as you see here, uh, title before typecast, title came from user, title question mark. But you'll also see the same set of methods for all the other columns on this, on this post table. So you'll see ID before typecast, all these things like that. And these are called attribute methods. Uh, and the term is important because they're actually modules for this in active model and also an active record. Uh, and this stuff seems kind of actually easy when you look at it on the surface, but actually active record uh, over, overrides a lot of the met models in active, uh, methods in active model, and, and this thing is actually not so simple. And this is not all of attributes. What I'm gonna talk about here, I'm gonna talk about attribute methods. It's not all of attributes, but it's kind of the entry point. If you wanna learn more about how attributes work, you really have to understand attribute methods, and it's not easy to understand. So that's what I'm gonna try to cover now in the next however many time I have left. Um, so let's go back to our picture here. We had a method mapping to a column. We, we haven't really contradicted anything here yet, uh, but we've elaborated a bit. So we can add a context. This method sits in a, um, in a module, which is an instance of this generated attribute methods thing, and that's in your model. Okay, so um, now, now we're gonna sit on the left side of this picture here. <laughs> See where that goes. So we're gonna assign that module to a mod here, to a, a variable named mod. And now what I, what I wanna do this is a bit like a genetic experiment where you kind of knock a gene out and you see what happens with and without the gene. So we have this module, we want to knock the module out and see what happens if we take out that module because it had all those methods on it. Uh, but you can't take modules out in Ruby. You can't just like take a module out of the ancestors. Uh, but you can do kind of an equivalent thing which is to remove all the methods on the module. So we can do that. Uh, we can just say, okay, module, give me all your instance methods, then iterate over them and for each one, we're gonna use this method, uh, remove method, it's a private method, so you have to call it with send. So you call remove method, you give the name of the method in, this will remove all the methods, and you can check. You can say, now mod, what are your instance methods? And this will now return an empty array. We've removed all the methods from the module. And you can double check, you can say, okay, post, give me your method title. Previously, this gave you back the method object, now it will raise a name error, undefined method title. So we're sure there is no title method on this thing anymore. So now we can go and say, okay, post, what's your title? And surprisingly, I think probably to most people, it will still return the elusive attribute. So this module is in one sense, it seems like it's really important, but we've just removed it and it seems to be working fine. So what's going on? So we can go back to our picture here. And what have we done? We've knocked out this, this method, right? And yet it still seems to be working. And if you know Ruby at any level, you probably know there's only really one way this can be happening, which is that we're hitting method missing and somehow method missing is handling that call and seems to be doing the same thing as before. It's still mapping to the column value. Okay, so now I wanna shift uh, to the other side of this picture. So what we did in the first part here is we kind of removed the, me the methods from that module, we saw what happened. Now we're gonna go to the other side of this picture and we're gonna try to remove the columns, which is gonna be a kind of a similar parallel kind of thing. Uh, and what I mean by when I say uh, we're gonna remove the columns, I don't mean we're gonna actually remove the columns from the, from the database. We're gonna, re we're gonna make active record think that there are no columns on this table, this post table. And this is gonna be a bit tricky, but we can do this. We can grab this thing called the schema cache. And the schema cache is what Active Record uses to what it sounds like to cache the schema. And the schema is what tells Active Record what are all the columns and all the tables in the database. Uh, and Active Record is not gonna let us uh, trick it to do this kind of thing. It's not, gonna be, it's not gonna make this easy for us, but we can do this like this. So we can grab, we can reach inside to this cache and grab this thing called a columns hash which is an instance variable. You have to get it with instance variable get because there's no public method to get it. And then what we can do is we can set the, uh, the value for the key posts uh, in this columns hash to an empty hash. And what this will do is that uh, it ha if, if Active Record has not yet uh, cached anything, then what this will do is it will tell Active Record, okay, I've already cached this thing and the value, it's an empty hash, which means there are no columns on that table. Normally these uh, hashes would be a mapping, mappings from uh, column names to types but since it's empty, Active Record's gonna interpret that to mean there are no columns on the post table. And we can go and confirm this, we can inspect the post class. And this is kind of funny, right? I mean, we don't normally see Active Record models whose tables have no columns, because it's kind of a useless thing, you would never really do this. But this is what it would look like if you had one. And then you can create an instance, and same thing, it looks kind of funny, because it doesn't have those attributes. Normally you would have, you know, title, whatever, whatever, uh, but that's not there, because there, Active Record thinks there are no columns on this table now. And then we can go ahead, we can say, okay, do you have a method, a setter method or any of those other methods? It's gonna raise a name error, it doesn't have any of those methods, which is not really surprising. 
We can try to set the title anyway. Maybe it's going to hit method missing. It doesn't. It raises an active model on an unknown attribute error. Um, then we can just check the attributes, and it's a blank hash. So this is not surprising. We've told our active record this table has no columns, so it's pretty much acting the way we'd expect it to act. Uh, but now we can do something a little bit different. Instead of creating a post, we can fetch the first post and assume now that our table uh, has one entry in it with a post with the title, the elusive attribute. Uh, and it's going to return to you again this post. And again, the post doesn't seem to have anything on it, so that's not surprising. But notice that we're making this select statement, right? We're select post star from post, which is always what you do when you, when you grab the first thing of a, of a model. And the database, remember, the database does have those columns on the table. So the database is going to return all those values, even though Active Record doesn't think it has those columns. Uh, and then you can again go and check those methods, like the getter method here. It's again going to raise a name error, so it doesn't have those methods. But then we can say, OK, post, what's your title? And it's again going to return the elusive attribute, even though Active Record doesn't think this thing has any columns on the table. And in fact, you can check the attributes on this thing, and it's going to return to you all of them. So in this case, the ID, the title, the, uh, the timestamps, and everything. And what's happening here is actually that what we're kind of exposing here is that Active Record treats attributes in kind of two different ways. The one kind of privileged way it treats attributes is sort of the ones that are actually defined in your schema. So your schema says these are the title on this, on this table, uh, these are the columns on this table, and those are kind of special in a way. Um, but then, then it treats also attributes in terms of what the database returns. And what the database returns, you can see if you do this kind of thing here. You can just call. This is what actually happens internally. You can call exec query on the active record based connection and give it the SQL string that it would normally use and look at the result. And it's going to return to you this active record result object. And you can check the columns on this result object. I use the, the word columns here is kind of liberal. I use air quotes for this because these, these are columns in a very liberal sense. Um, but in this case, it's returning you columns ID, title, created, update, edit, and the values for these things. And the key point here is that this result that comes back from the, from the query is completely independent of this whatever the schema cache is. And you can check this. You can say, OK, post, what are your column names? And it's still going to tell you the column names are, there's none. There's no columns on this table. But it's happy to return to you these things and let you access them. So if we go back to this picture now, uh, what's happened? Well, we've now knocked out the column from the schema. And this has sort of knocked out the method. In fact, it never defined the method for these things because there was no columns for them. But when we call the, um, that title method, what happened was that it, it, went, it seemed to go through method missing, uh, and it went directly to the result, which came back from the database. And this, I'm going to refer to this as a kind of a backdoor route. Uh, so we have the front door, which is the one we're kind of accustomed to, which we think about, which is going from a method to some uh, value which, is, which corresponds to a column on the table. But then there's another route, actually, which you probably don't know about, which goes through method missing and gets the value, if there's a result corresponding to that, to that name, uh, from the result from the database. And this may seem kind of artificial, and I've kind of tricked Active Record into you know, thinking there were no columns on the table, and why would this ever even matter? Uh, but there's a reason this is here. And as far as I know, I'm the first person to give you the reason for this. I've never found anybody else who's explained this. Um, this is the reason it's here. It's there. Uh, if you've ever used this type of pattern, this is not a super common pattern, but it's pretty frequently used. I think probably most of you have actually I've at least seen it. Uh, this is the case where you do a query method like select or group, and you give in some uh, SQL. And then you alias something, right? So you alias like title to foo. This is kind of a stupid example. but And then you grab the first thing, right? First one. And then you call foo. And now if you think about it, foo can't be a method here, right? It's not going to be a method. Uh, if you actually wanted it to be a method, you'd have to define a method every time you did a query like this. Uh, it's not practical for Active Record to do that. So what, the reason why there is that method missing thing there is to, is to handle this, this case where you're aliasing something to something else, the database will now return to you this foo thing, and somehow you have to be able to access it. So this falls through the method missing, and that's what it's there for. So we can go back to that picture, and to make things a little more concrete now, we've got like this title method. Title is the method we're going to hit when we, when we just do a, like the first, so we select post from post, uh, and, then, and then that's going to be our, kind of our front door route here. And then the method missing, we, when we do select uh, title as foo, Foo is not going to be a method, so we're going to hit method missing. But method missing is going to go through this backdoor route, and it's going to get the value from the result, which was returned from the database. OK, so that was sort of the first, the first section. Now I want to kind of look at a better, I think a, a more accurate way of looking how this actually works, which is to start from the frame. And this is going to be in terms of these things called um, what are matchers and dispatchers. So uh, to think about this, I want to kind of think about this in terms um, not of sort of describing how things just are, but how in terms of uh, the kind of constraints that this frame actually satisfies. 
And there's going to be kind of two key, key constraints which are really going to determine how this works. And the first one is a constraint not of uh, Rails, it's of Ruby. And probably a lot of you are familiar with this. It's a very basic thing. In Ruby, uh, methods are fast, relatively speaking, uh, and method missing is slow. Uh, actually, method missing is very slow. So you generally want to avoid method missing if you can. The second thing uh, is that the schema is static. And this, I think, is obvious. If the schema wasn't static, it would kind of defeat the purpose of having one in the first place. Um, but attributes are dynamic, and this is the one that's not obvious. And that's why I just showed you that select statement example. Attributes can have any name you want them to have. You just alias something, and it can be anything. And so active record has to deal with that. In fact, active model has to deal with this. Active model deals with it for active record. But um, this has to be handled. And so the solution that, that, that is there in the code has these kind of two different things. One is the front door route where we, where we kind of take the schema, we define the message for the, everything that's in the schema, and those are fast, and those are what we usually are hitting. But when you alias something, we go through this backdoor route, and in that case, we use method missing to handle these dynamic attribute names. And the thing that's going to sit sort of in the center of this whole thing is going to be this very innocent thing called this attribute method matcher. And this sits, if you're looking this up, you want to look this up, it's an active model attribute methods towards the bottom of the file. It's a very simple class. It's not complicated. Uh, but the role that it plays is not obvious at all and not, not particularly documented anywhere as far as I can tell. And this thing is just, basically it's just a combination of a prefix and a suffix. So in this case, I'm looking at the, uh, the dirty uh, was uh, matcher, uh, which you may have used. Uh, and this thing is going to, these matchers are going to kind of run in two different directions. Uh, they're going to be kind of a forward direction for the front door and a kind of a reverse, reverse direction I'm going to refer to it as for the back door. And in the, in the forward direction, the term matcher itself is going to be confusing, as you'll see. But we'll get to the reason why it's called a matcher in a second. So what do we do? We take all these columns from the database and we kind of sit them, like stick them into this machine here. And then it pops out. It puts the prefix in the beginning and the suffix at the end. And it, we get title was. That's not so surprising. That's our method name we're generating here. And then we're also going to generate this thing called a target, which is where we're going to take the string attribute and do the same thing. So that's going to give us attribute was. And then we're going to, we're going to create what's, what I'm going to refer to here as a dispatcher method, which is just title, define title was, and it's going to take the arguments, and then it's going to call this, this, att this method attribute was, which is kind of a generic method, pass in title, which is the name of the attribute, and the other arguments. Um, and, and this is how it's going to work. And this is where the front door code, where this actually is used. Uh, this is, you can find this in active model lottery methods. Uh, this is not terribly complicated, but it's, it's going through these matchers. So just for reference, there are currently 18 of these matchers. Most, uh, the majority of them are for dirty, uh, dirty matching, dirty tracking. Uh, but there's a bunch of other ones as well. Those are those ones that I showed you earlier in that set of methods. So what are we doing? We're taking this attribute name title from the schema. We're calling method name here, which I just showed you. And now we're taking method name, which is like title was. Uh, we're taking this target, this handler method called attribute was. We're taking the attribute name title. And we're sending them to this method define proxy call, uh, which has a you know, really intuitive uh, name. Uh, and then you see this generated attribute methods here. That's that module that I mentioned I gave a name to. So it's going to define that method I just showed you on that module. And it's going to do that for every column, for every, every, each, of those, each of those patterns. Right? That, that, this is the front door. This is a little bit the easier one to understand. The other way we're going to look at this is in terms of the, the backdoor route, the one where we go through method missing. And here, the way to think about this, I think, is to kind of take this machine and kind of flip it in reverse. And we're going to convert the, the prefix and the suffix to a regex. So now we're matching stuff. And this is where the matcher name comes from. The matcher name is really confusing because matchers and matching is not the main thing that it does anymore anyway. It once did. You can do a bit of Git archaeology on this, and you can go back. And originally, the main role here was matching stuff, but it's not matching anymore. But it still does match. Uh, and so when it matches, it's going to be handling something like this. So we get a method like foo was. Uh, there's no method foo was. So it falls through to method missing. And method missing is going to pass this to all those matchers. And they're pretty much all going to return nil because they don't match any of the other patterns. But this matcher here is going to match. Uh, it's going to capture foo here. So foo is going to be a capture from this thing. And then again, it's going to have this attribute was handler method. And so previously, we were defining, uh, defining methods, handler methods. Uh, dispatch method, sorry. And now we're going to be, but now we're going to be actually dispatching from method missing. And this is where the code, this is the code that actually does this. Uh, this is a, like a fantastic method name, I think. Attribute method matchers matching. <laughs> um, so this code here you can ignore. I'm in a debate with a Rails core team to get this removed currently. Uh, but basically, this is not really important, <laughs> uh, of which some members are here right now. So. Um, this is, this is the important part here. So we're going through all the matchers. I said there's 18 of them, right? And they're, in this case, for foo was, none of them are going to match except for the was matcher. Um, well, actually, one more, but we'll get to that. But basically, the was matcher is going to match here. 
and it's going to match foo. It's going to say the capture is foo, and then the, the handler method is attribute was, and it's going to dispatch to that thing. Uh, and so we can now try to visualize what this whole thing looks like if we were to actually draw it. So what, what are we going to do? We're going to put the matcher thing in the middle of this picture now. So this is the matcher. There's going to be 18 of these matchers, but we're just going to look at one for now. This is like the was matcher. And then what? We have for each matcher, we have a dispatch target. This is going to be a method that is actually defined. I'll show you one in a second. So in this case, it's going to be an attribute was uh, ma uh, method. And then we're going to have two different directions, right? So one method, we're going to be defining methods. And this is the case, uh, this method I showed you, define proxy call. And this, this, this arrow here is not a calling uh, arrow. This is like a method definition arrow. So we're defining a method called title was. And then title was uh, calls attribute was with the argument title. That's what that method will do. And then the other direction is that we're coming from method missing. So we're coming this way. And now method missing is calling match with this foo was on all the matches. And again, they're pretty much all going to uh, return nil. So it's going to skip all of them, except this one's going to match. And then, and this is important, method missing is then going to say, OK, it matches. The capture is foo. But before it actually dispatches, it's going to say, OK, is foo actually in my results? Like, is that foo? Did I actually get something called foo in the results? And if not, it's, it's going to ignore it. But if foo did come back, if we alias titled to foo and there was a foo something in the, in the, in the database results, uh, in, the, in the query results, then it's going to then do the same kind of type of thing here. It's going to dispatch to attribute was with the argument foo. And you notice here that both paths are ending up in the same place. And that explains a little bit why earlier on, when we took away the module and we called title, it still ended up in the same place. Because whether you go through the method, which is faster and preferable, or whether you hit method missing, you both end up in the same place ultimately. Um, so the top one here is the front door route, as I mentioned. The bottom one here is the back door route through method missing. And just to see where this actually happens, you can go into active model dirty. Uh, and there's a class, there are class methods to define these matchers. And so this is for the dirty stuff. You can see there's an attribute method suffix here. And it gives a bunch of suffixes. And these define matchers. So we looked at the was matcher there. But there are a bunch of other matchers. And as I said, there's a total of 18 of them. Here there are four defined uh, in he right here. And for each of, those, each of those things, there's a method. I'm showing you just one of them here, like this, which will actually handle these, these method calls. So this is attribute was. Uh, and it tells you what the previous value of an attribute named adder here uh, was. OK, so now we come to what is, uh, in some ways, sort of the, the punchline of this talk. Uh, the title of this talk is the elusive attribute. Uh, and I've been talking about this was matcher thing. Um, but, and, and there are 18 of these matchers, right? But what nobody will actually tell you, uh, if you look at the code anywhere, as far as I can tell, is that there is one matcher uh, that is vastly more important than any of the other matchers. And you really couldn't have any, any meaningful Rails application without this matcher. And that's this matcher here. <clears throat> and, and talk about being elusive, right? I showed you the dirty matchers. They, they're declared. But this one is not declared. It's just the default value uh, in this attribute method matchers array. You never declare it. It's just there. And not only that, it doesn't take any arguments. It just, it just, we just call new on this thing to generate this thing. And if you look at the, uh, the attribute method matcher class and see what happens when you don't pass anything into the initializer, what happens is you get a blank prefix and a blank suffix. So this default matcher is the matcher with a blank prefix and a blank suffix. And what does a matcher with a blank prefix and a blank suffix do? Well, in, in the, when we go into the, the, for, the, the, um, the front door and we're defining methods, if you pass it a column name like title, it just doesn't do anything to it. It just defines title. And if you're going in the other direction and you're coming with foo, uh, it's, it's going to call match. But match is always going to return true because the regex is going to be like always true. And then you're going to take foo and check is it actually a result that was returned from, from the database. And if so, you're then going to call through. So this is the matcher for getter methods, right? which is the most important attribute methods we have. So we can go back to this picture that I had here where we had all this was stuff. And we can kind of consider what is actually the more important case here. Uh, the case where we have a blank prefix and a blank suffix. This seems kind of weird, because what's the point of a ma matcher with a blank prefix and blank suffix? But this is actually the most important one, which is, which is one of the things that's really hard to understand about this whole thing. So what happens here is when we have a blank prefix and blank suffix, we define all the getter methods. And those getter methods map to an a, a method named attribute, because we take the string attribute. We don't append, we don't prepend anything. We don't append anything. We just get the method name attribute. And that's what's actually called from inside the title method. And the same thing when you fall through to method missing with a, method, with, a, with a call like foo, this will again fall through to the same method attribute. And this method attribute, you can find in active record attribute methods, um, the read module. And it's there at the bottom. It's very innocently sitting there. Um, it's actually an alias. It's actually a private alias uh, <laughs> to make it yet more elusive. 
Uh, and this thing just aliases to read attribute, underscore read attribute, which is, a, which is an internal method to fetch the value from an internal hash of attributes. So that's what it does. So we can go back to this picture now. And we're almost there, we're getting there. Uh, so the title method, when you define it, it calls this method attribute uh, which passed the title, and that thing now aliases to read attribute, which then gets it from some hash internally. And method missing does basically the same thing. Um, except it's a little more complicated than that, unfortunately. Uh, and this is one of the tricky things about unpacking Rails, is that everything is quite heavily optimized. Uh, and so I mentioned there are 18 matchers, and eight of six, 16 of those 18 matchers work like this. But the two most important ones, which are your getter methods, and your second by far most important one, which is your, uh, your getter and your setter. Those ones have to be optimized. So actually, for reasons that are uh, kind of hard to explain in the scope of this talk, what actually happens is that Active Model gives a kind of hook to Active Record to bypass this alias and define it in a custom way. So what actually happens is this. So the title method actually is defined, so it basically does the same thing, but in a slightly faster way. And now this, as far as, uh, as, far as I'm concerned, is an accurate depiction of how attributes are actually defined uh, in Active Record, and also basically in Active Model, but in Active Record. Um, and I think if we look at this now, and I hope at least you've got a, got a sense of how this works, but um, you know, this, this works. Um, it's reasonably, re reasonably performant. Um, but is it easy to unpack? Like, I would say no, no way. Uh, I hope I haven't lost everybody in the process of unpacking it. Um, so I think we can think about maybe uh, what there is maybe to improve here. And that's what I want to do in the last uh, little bit that I have left. So. Um, in case anybody has been you know, totally ignoring my whole talk because you've been tormented trying to figure out what a bicycle frame actually looks like, <laughs> uh, this is what a bicycle frame actually looks like. Um, and I think it's, it's actually relevant to look at a bicycle frame because bicycle frames are kind of elegant in a way, right? Um, you, know, you can't just make a frame however you want. Like that bicycle that I showed you in the introduction there that was based on a drawing would never work, right? Because it doesn't reflect the actual loads on a bicycle. Uh, a bicycle frames are designed uh, to, to, to have the sort of the minimal solution to the problem of carrying somebody on two wheels, right? And I think that's kind of really elegant, right? They don't do anything more than that, they just do that. And if you look at bicycles, they tend to have the same type of frames because they've optimized, they've solved that problem in a kind of a minimal way. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think that the solution that I just showed you uh, is actually minimal in that way. And that makes it harder to understand. So what do I mean by that? So as I said, um, the reason that we have that whole method missing root uh, that, that is the hard part to understand and that people don't really know about is to handle this pattern. This is why it's there. By the way, nobody told me this is why it's there. Uh, the only reason I know this is why it's there is because I said, why is it there? I yanked it out, I ran the test, and certain ones fail, and this is the ones that fail. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm actually not, I mean, uh, there's rail core team members here, but I'm pretty sure this is the reason it's there. Now, it actually was there for other reasons in the past, but those other reasons have disappeared, and this is now the only remaining reason why it's really there, is to support this pattern. Uh, and because I was kind of in this questioning mode and trying to figure out what in the world is going on with this thing, uh, you know, I kind of dug deeper and I said, okay, you know, we, we need to support this pattern, right? But actually, the, what I showed you in that picture of the frame, it's designed to support more than that, actually, right? And if you think about it, because of the way it's designed, it's gonna support this as well. It should. And it should also support this. This is actually the example that I was showing you earlier. And some of you may have sort of wondered, why are you doing a was on something that's aliased? It might seem kind of weird, but this is supported. This is also supported. Um, if this doesn't seem strange to you, we can substitute this select to this. And now this should start to look a bit weird, right? This actually works. So you can alias the number one to O-N-E. You can fetch O-N-E and it gives you back one. You can also change one to two. You can check what one was and it'll tell you what it was. And then you can check the change on one and it will tell you a change from one to two. You obviously can't save this because you can't change the number one. <laughs> but this seems, this seems weird, at least weird, if not, if not sort of a bug in a way. But actually, it kind of gets weirder. So this is a a slightly contrived example, but uh, bear with me here. So I work at a company with a payment gateway. Uh, in Japan, they're gonna raise the tax, they say, from 8% to 10% this year. They've said this for many years and they never actually do it, so it may not actually happen. But for the purpose of this example, we do a select, we select the amount. We select the amount times 0 0.08, 8% to get the tax. We select the amount times 0 0.02 to get the tax change, that's the 2% increase to 10%. And then we say, okay, get the first payment. Uh, we get the amount, it turns out to be 100 yen. We check the tax, it's 8% of 100 yen, so that's eight yen. And then we check the tax change, and that should be 
two, but it's actually me. <laughs> and this is actually true. This is actually what happens if you do this. Um, and if you were able to follow what I've been saying so far in this talk, if I didn't speak too quickly through it all, um, you should kind of maybe have an idea why this is happening. And this is actually why it's happening. So what's happening is that uh, you get this tax change. You're, you're asking for a tax change. There, <clears throat> there is no method named tax change. So tax change falls through to method missing. Method missing says, okay, matchers, you know, do you, do you match this? And most of them don't match. But the change matcher will match on this. It will capture tax. Uh, and then it will say, okay, is tax an attribute? And it will say, yes, tax is an attribute because we aliased that thing to tax. And so this will actually work and it will interpret this as the change to the tax attribute, which is kind of meaningless actually. But it will interpret it that way and therefore it will return to you nil because there was no change in tax. Which doesn't make any sense because you can't change tax. You can't change things that you're aliasing in raw SQL. So the interpretation here doesn't make any sense, but this is actually how it will work. And if you, if you actually kind of think about this, this kind of brings up a real point here, which is that I've told you that we have this, this front door root and this back door root, and they're connected by this matcher thing. And the matcher thing is called a matcher, but the main role is not actually to match, it's to define methods. And its secondary role is to match. Why do we want it to match? So that we can handle this case where you call foo, and foo's been aliased by title. Uh, but in the case where you actually match that thing, you only care about the getter methods, right? You don't care about this kind of stuff. And in fact, in the rare case where this actually matches, it's actually more like a bug than what you want. So I think actually this stuff shouldn't even be there. Uh, and so why am I telling you all this, right? So one of the reasons is that, well, this is, this is sort of a pitch uh, to allow me to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think it's real because I asked a lot of people, do you know how attributes are defined in, in active record, right? And I didn't really get anybody who could really explain at any level of detail how this works. Um, and actually, it took me a long time to figure out how this works. And I think that's not good, right? I think this is bad for Rails as a community. We should know how our attributes are defined. Uh, I think this is really important. And the problem is that this, this code right now is really hard to unpack. Uh, it's really hard to unpack because, as I said, it's not minimal in the sense of that bicycle frame. It's doing more than it needs to do, and that more is very hard to understand because if you're trying to reason about why it's there, it doesn't really make sense until you look at the history of it and everything that came before. Um, but there's another point that I kind of want to make, um, which is that you know, this is a track on unpacking Rails. So on the theme of unpacking Rails, uh, I think I see a lot of people writing about you know, how they're opening up Rails and, oh, look, it's amazing metaprogramming, and it's kind of this, this spirit of reverence, like this is this holy grail or something. And I think this is the wrong attitude, right? I think we need to be questioning this stuff, and you need to really be poking it and trying to break it and take it apart and see where it breaks. Uh, and because that's the way you're gonna understand, right? That's the way you're gonna understand how it works. And so, you know, you don't learn to draw a bicycle by just kind of staring at it. You learn to, to draw a bicycle, or you, you, you gain that understanding by actually kind of fixing the bicycle. So I, I think the message here that I wanna leave with is that, you know, don't just, un unpacking is great, don't get me wrong, but don't just unpack stuff. When you're unpacking it, Poke it, see if it breaks. Maybe 90% of the time or 99% of the time, you'll realize that you, know, you were just stupid or whatever. You didn't realize and actually there was a reason for it. And then you'll learn something that's great. But that remaining 1% of the time, you may learn something that's actually important, right? So don't just unpack rails. Don't just, uh, don't just uh, ride the bicycle. Fix it. Uh, that'll help you to understand better how attributes work. That's how you'll learn how rails works. And I think that's how we'll help everybody understand how rails works. Thank you.